Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful. For the faithful, I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing today? Uh, good. It seems like it's a little bit of a gray day out there. The first one, we've maybe it'll clear off. We've had such fantastic weather here that uh, it'll, be, it'll be heartbreaking to lose it as we head into another cold winter. But um, other than that, I'm doing okay. How about you? I'm doing well, thanks. It's, uh, but uh, heading into the winter and uh, not having any hockey, that's going to be something to deal with. I mean, we, we do have experience of three past lockers guide us through but uh everything all ass backwards right now eh? i mean we should be dropping the puck on the new season right now it's very uh, confusing eh? this whole like the draft like to get your head around like the draft is this day and free agencies that it just seems everything is so out of sync and this is just another thing that's so out of sync and and here we go anyway bruce um out of all this discombobulation comes the calm words of Oilers GM Ken Holland and a very low key press conference, especially in compared to like all the wild trade rumors that we're hearing. And I, I think oh, we've heard more yeah. wild trade rumors than normal. <laughs> top of the list, Bruce, and I, we were, top of the list was something you referred to, like trading Ryan Nugent Hopkins, tra- trading Ryan Nugent Hopkins for the negotiating rights to Taylor Hall, which was reported. I mean, my goodness, of all the rumors I've heard, that's got to be the wildest. Like, why on earth would you ever give up that much to for the negotiating rights to a hockey player? But that this is where it's come. Like, there's just the wild rumors out there. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, that that was, uh, I think, a reporter spitballing, uh, you know, looking yeah, at all the Canadian enough. teams. This is, this is what they need. This is what they, and he was looking more at creating cap space to sign Taylor Hall. But I can't imagine a world where you'd actually trade a signed star player for someone else's negotiating rights. You trade like a sixth round pick for that, those negotiating rights. And you trade the signed star player to some other team where you get like a first round pick back for him or, you know, a good prospect and a pick. Taylor Hall's come this far not to go into free agency and see what's out there. Like that's Mm -hmm. not on in the cards and you know, let's talk to him on friday instead of monday and not give up ryan nugent hopkins to get him because <laughs> <laughs> you can trade nugent hopkins for a first oh, pick man. at the very least i mean this is just anyway there's oh, all these rumors peter trade. angelo ekman larson uh you know tyson berry jacob markstrom there's what was that what do we got going my, on there my, my kitty does he have a bell around his his neck yeah she uh, does so okay all right there you go bruce let's start up we'll just go through the press conference that hall and just had and we'll talk about the things you know kind of in somewhat order of importance but the most important thing, thing is the draft tomorrow and because of the oilers screwed up because of the nhl screwed up season the oilers aren't going to be drafting in the 20s this year as they would have been normally because of how it all played out with the play-in round and losing in the play-in round, they have the 14th overall pick. And Bruce, I have to say, I, I was heartened by what Holland had to say, and here's what he said today. If you had to handicap it, I don't see us drafting a defenseman, given all the defensemen that we've got. And earlier in the press conference, he had talked about four players, Evan Bouchard, Dmitry Samarukov, who's apparently doing quite well in the KHL this year after not mm. being so strong in the AHL last sure. year, but which is an unexpected first-year pro. Uh, he mentioned Philip Broberg, who's ripping it up in the uh, Swedish Hockey League. And he mentioned Caleb Jones. I always notice he, 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 uh, Caleb Jones is never at the top of the list. He'd be at, If I was talking about the Oilers' defensive prospects and who you're going to count on next year Caleb Jones would be first thing out of my mouth but he always seems to be down Holland's lifts which I find kind of interesting but Bruce so they talked about um drafting a fo- not a forward but not taking a defenseman what, what's right. your take on that well they've taken defensemen the first round the last two years yeah. and you know that so they they've I mean, they needed to take at least one in those two years. Uh, you know, no problem with that. But when they, when Holland kind of went against the um, expectation last year and took another defenseman, 
I think if the die is cast that this year they're they're going to be needing a forward. And the fact that they've traded out their second round pick uh, means that there's no, I mean, the last two years they did pretty well, you know, they got Evan Bouchard and they came back with Ryan McLeod in the second round. They took Philip Roberg with uh, uh, Raphael Lavoie in the second round. And they wound up getting a pretty decent forward prospect both years. Well, this year there is no second round. Uh, that's gone. And so if they're going to get a good forward, uh, they're going to get it at number 14 or they're going to get it, at, you know, if they, in a trade down scenario where they're still picking in the first round. Uh, you know, the obvious, I mean, best player available is, uh, is axiomatic. And yet when you get down to number 14, there's a lot of best players there. There's not usually some guy that comes screaming off the top of the pile, you know, because he'd be gone already unless you have some kind of, you know, particular information or, or feeling for a guy. Uh, and I'd be very surprised if that were a defenseman. I would have been surprised before, but hearing what Holland said, all the more surprised. And I don't think he's like, he gives misdirection. That doesn't seem to be Holland's, what he does at all. Like, he's not, Ooh. he's not like saying, we're, like, we're going to take a forward to fool somebody else. He, I mean, they're thinking to take it, they're thinking forwards, it's going to be a forward. He's, he doesn't seem to have any kind of subterfuge in his messaging at all. I've never noticed it at oh. all. So I'm taking this for what it's at face just, value. Just He's straight goods. So Bruce, there are the good. Here's the other good news. This is supposed to be a draft that's not only extremely deep, but particularly mm -hmm. deep in forwards. And we see yes. this in the kind of their, um, at least for the North American players, their major junior scoring level. So you have a player like Seth Jarvis, mm -hmm. um, who's in the consensus draft rankings, which I posted at the Call to Hockey. And I get yeah. those rankings by combining the 20 top right. public draft experts and, and averaging, like, listing how they, what they've all ranked the players and, and coming up with an average ranking for them. And, and so, so Seth Jarvis, for instance, ranks 15th. He's a forward out of Portland. But his point per game was like, you know, Steven Stamkos is, is in his draft year. <laughs> um, you know, this is a player who, who scored at a high enough level in other years, he would have been t taken between 5th and 10th. I have zero doubt about that. But this year, he could easily fall to the Oilers at 14. I mean, I don't think he's going to fall much lower than that, but there's a real possibility he'll be there. Jack Quinn, another really strong scoring player, one of, you know, a real goal scorer. Um, uh, Connor Zary, he, he scored at the same level as Ryan Nugent Hopkins. In his final, in both of their draft years, Connor Zary's at Nugent Hopkins is level 1.5 a game about. So there's all of these players who have really high levels of scoring in major junior hockey in their draft year who are going to be available. One of those guys is going to be available to the Oilers almost certainly. There's not, the, the other interesting thing though is when you look at the history of the draft, when you look at the top 20 picks, there's usually five or six defensemen taken each time. Now, so this leads me to think that, you know, and in the top 10, there's usually a few. So there's only a few top rated defensemen, Jamie Drysdale, Jake Sanderson. Then the next one, you go down to Caden Gooley at 20, who's been mentioned as a possible Oilers pick and Braden Schneider at 21. I, I, I expect my bet is three of those guys will be gone before the Oilers draft just because other teams are going to be drafting for need as well. And they're not going to be taking a forward. They really need defensemen. And there's some good defensemen here. Caden Gooley mm -hmm. and Braden Schneider are good defensemen. There might be someone that where you not look have in mind that, that I'm not mentioning. So I think there'll be probably Drysdale, Sanderson for sure will be taken. And I bet you there'll be another guy. Plus mm -hmm. Askarov, uh, I think, will all be gone before the Oilers draft. And the Oilers are going to get a, a very good player. And um, doesn't look like they're going to be reaching for a defenseman because either Gooley or Schneider, at least if you go by the consensus picks, would be a reach. Not that big a reach, though. I mean, Philip Broberg was also a reach last year yeah, if you go by the consensus bit. experts. And he's he seems to be turning out. What do you think, Bruce? Is he turning out? Well, oh, certainly the arrows are pointing in positive directions on Broberg. All of the initial bleating about the, uh, about the wasted pick uh, seems to have silenced down a little bit, and <laughs> the the, uh, the early certainty about just being a good or bad pick. I mean, these times you just gotta, you know, you gotta wait and see if the cake's gonna rise, right? <laughs> just... 
<laughs> Do you have enough water in there? You have a, too uh, much yeast, not enough. Mm-hmm. Does cake have yeast? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it. I don't make a lot of cake, so I know bread. Bread has yeast, so will the bread rise nice and fluffy or not? Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, um, recruits.ca's draft list today, and uh, Caden Gooley, they got him ranked 11th. So that wouldn't be, you know, I mean, he's right in the neighborhood, but I just don't think that if it comes down to a toss up between a defenseman and a forward, I think they're going to lean to the forward. Yeah. All right. So we'll be uh, watching that closely tomorrow, and it looks like they're going to keep their. There's always talk they're going to trade the pick or trade down, and it almost never happens. Like it's like a one in twenty year event, like the, the one in ten year event that the Oilers actually do anything, like trade that pick. It's it's worked out, I'd say, worked out with the Dwayne Rolfson trade where they traded their first pick, and then not so great with the Griffin Reinhardt trade, and terrible with the trade down in two thousand and three, as you've mentioned once yeah. or twice, uh, where they passed up in the last podcast. I may have mentioned that. Yeah. So it doesn't look like, who knows, they might trade down. There is a ton of really good forwards available. And who knows, maybe they're going to want to trade down so they can they can draft a couple of them rather than just one of them. And maybe that's not a terrible idea. I, I don't know. I, I haven't watched these players play. So, yeah, well, All right, let's go ahead. Let's move on to the next. Say the the one ahead. name that keeps popping up is Seth Jarvis. I've got him ranked number 13. So that's right again in the Oilers wheelhouse a lot of these guys are really small hey eh? this year a lot of the, the small dynamic forwards and uh, nothing against that but it's just unusual it seems like most years they're they're talking largely about you know bigger guys and the odd small guy and this year there's a ton of guys that are under six feet yeah all right so we have it just seems like they're not holding it against people being players being so small like it's not as big a big an issue these days Holland talk about, and I thought this was quite um, revealing. I think people reveal themselves, Bruce, in the words that they use. And he talk about he talked about tweaks. Mm-hmm. They're going to make some tweaks here. So this was their overall strategy in the next month as they're putting together the team for next year. And he didn't talk about any kind of big moves, bold moves, anything like that. It was tweaks. We also heard tweaks from... Bob Nicholson, I think, uh, um, a, about a, three weeks ago where he was talking to mm-hmm. Stoffer, I believe. And Same he talked about no major move, just tweaks. And, I, and I, again, I think it was just, he just honestly said what they're thinking. And, David, uh, I heard Evan Bouchard in the first round pick and Chris Russell for Oliver ekman Larson, And I heard the uh, Ryan Nugent Hopkins for the signing or the negotiation rights to Taylor Hall, and I heard a whole bunch of stuff that sounded like big moves to me, but Ken Holland saying that they're probably not going to make any big moves kind of carries a little bit of weight, I have to say. I loved what he said, Bruce, when he was asked about the ekman Larson trade. Here's Holland's quote. Uh, he said, he, first of all, he said he couldn't comment on ekman Larson because he's signed with another team, and then he adds, I would say to you, it's rumor season. This is the time of year when there's rumors. And some rumors have some truth to them. Lots of rumors are just someone is making up and playing general manager at home. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know where the Bouchard, like, like where the idea that you would trade Bouchard for, and a first pick overall for Ekman Larson. I just, like, it, it's hard to imagine that, that Edmonton, you would offer that. I mean, it's just such oh. a tremendous overpay for Ekman Larson. If you ask me, it's, 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 so I can see Arizona asking that now maybe, but it was, you know, the, the, we got to the point last week where Elliot Friedman was on the air on Friday, having like feeling the need to, to make it clear that he, he didn't think this was coming from the Oilers, but that's how big that rumor got last week that the Oilers had actually offered that. And, I don't know. I just thought that was nuts the first second I heard of the rumor. I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the market in the cap era that, you know, when you're paying a player sort of the market rate for his services, trading that guy, trading that guy out, the other team is picking up his contract and they're going to pay the market rate for his services as if they bought him on the free agent market. I don't get that you have to 
give up a boatload of assets unless the guy is some kind of bargain or he's some, you know, specific answer. And in the case of OEL, I think his contract's high. And I just don't see how, you know, I mean, Arizona's looking to move the contract and also looking to grab a, a you know, a, a mother load of draft picks and prospects. It just doesn't add up, right? You're paying twice for that, and that's just not worth it. Well, in the cap world, like there's there's two different issues. There's the performance of the player, and then there's the performance of the player compared to his salary. Exactly. And and that's the whole way you value NHL players is not even the performance. If you have a guy who's a, t- a first line forward, let's say, and he and he's a he's a decent first line forward, decent two way player, gets forty points, let's say, not a great yeah. score, but a good score, fifty points. But he's earning ten million dollars a year. That player has negative value on your team. Like yeah. he he's not living up to the contract. And I think there's a non-zero chance, maybe like a 50-50 chance that over the term of Ekman Larson's contract, he actually has negative value. He's going to have negative value. That he, yeah. you're paying him 8.25 million a year. That's really loud. That that bell in my hey. in my, Sorry, she's right next to the mic. Sorry. Oh, oh that's okay. It's just, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's it's quite a shrill little sound there. Hey, cat. Um. <laughs> So he, I think Bruce, there's a there's a decent chance he has negative value, and any trade in mind, like you, you could make an argument, well, Arizona should actually throw in a second round pick or a third round pick in order to move OEL out. Like it's not, I don't think that's, it's not going to happen. I think some team oh. will value enough to offer something for him, mm-hmm. but I can't. I, I I'd be, like if if your team was just to give OEL a free agent contract the next seven years for eight point two five million, and that's all it was, and you were evaluating that, you'd think, wow, wow. that might work out. But that might not work out. And then the idea of throwing in like a first overall first round pick as well. No, no, thank you. And then first round pick plus your second best or best defenseman prospect who's a really good prospect. Like, are you nuts? Like, who are you? Are you? Where's this coming from? Like, on what? I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I really undervalue. It's coming from Arizona. It's coming from Arizona. Yeah. And as Brian Lawton has said, uh, you get these new GMs in and they tend to overvalue their players a little bit. Like they don't want to get taken on a trade, their first trade. And they're, and then nothing happens, right? So that's my bet is nothing's going to happen here. All right, let's go to back to the some of the comments Holland made about um, the market this year. Because he made a number of, I thought, really kind of fairly mundane statements of but good summaries of the NHL trade market. He said, first of all, that his top priority remains third line center and goalie. Um, no surprise there. And he, t- he talked about he's going to go on the UFA market. There's going to be a lot of movement on the UFA market, and he thinks he's going to go there. But he said of the UFA market that you pay an extra price. He said you pay it's longer term than you'd like or higher cap than you'd like if you want to add the player. That's his. That was his law of signing UFAs, and I don't think I've heard it summed up ever better no. than that. Every time you sign or a UFA, both. almost without exception, it's or both, too much term or too much cap, and he's well aware of it. And I wonder if that will change this year, Bruce. And as you answer, I'm going to go. I have to go get my battery for this computer. It's going to die out. So you you talk, and I'll go get my battery. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's too much term. It's too much. Uh, uh, it's too much cap hit. Uh, it's too many movements. It's, uh, it's too many uh, um, signing bonuses. It's too many you no know, movement clauses. There's so many different ways that the managers fall for the uh, uh, for the uh, to the players' advantage and to the to uh, management's disadvantage. And I think they're wising up to that. I think they're finally starting to figure out that. If you're given, you know, you don't have to give the guy everything. And if you do, then maybe you don't want that guy. I mean, we've seen too many teams trying to dig out from under contracts like the Milan Lucic one. Or we've seen too many too many teams that recently have had to, you know, buy out players because they overpaid them and they gave them too much term. That's It's actually the term that's the killer oftentimes where you give the guy the extra year or two years and it, it just hangs over that contract for the entire duration of it. I mean, how long we've been talking about Chris Russell in that fourth year on his contract, David. And 
may work Bruce. out the fourth year, Bruce, if Clef bombs. Yeah, hurt, I guess. <laughs> they might be happy to have Chris Russell all of a sudden. Suddenly, the, the what I've been calling the alpha move of the Oilers season is trading Chris Russell. Suddenly, that's a little bit in doubt. Uh, you might want to have Chris Russell um, on your team if you're missing Oscar Clefbaum for a good part of the year. I think that that might be out the window. Bruce, what do you think of the priorities? The goalie and the third line center, would that be, would you agree with those priorities? or? <sighs> Yeah, I think so. The, 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 I mean, the goalie is, it's kind of in a category by itself in that, I mean, obviously you've got to have one and obviously this is a problem that can be solved uh, just directly from the market. There's going to be uh, goalies available and pretty good ones, I think, for a reasonable cost. Um, I mean, you, you, you might make a trade, but you're not forced to make a trade. Whereas center, going out for a th- uh, third-line center, I mean, every year you, they seem to be talking about that. And every year you look at the at the open market and you think, well, geez, that's a fourth-line guy. That's a borderline fifth-line guy. You know, that guy's more a winger than a center. Well, you know, that guy's more a top-six player. But if you need him to play 3C, I don't know that he's got the defensive chops, et cetera, et cetera. It's almost never a perfect solution for the 3C. And... The one year they did trade for one Ryan Strom, they turned around and basically gave the guy away after. So, when was the last uh, time the Oilers developed a third line center, Bruce? Like, I guess with the Horkoff, Stoll. Well, they had Pekka. Who else do they have there? Uh, Horkoff and Stoll were their own uh, were their own developed players. Brodziak. Certainly, certainly say one with a three C. Brodziak was a good four C, trending towards three C when they got rid of him for nothing. Uh, who was the uh, reasoner? Was who was the other center on that team? Uh, know, Rem, Mur- Rem Murray was the uh, after oh, they yeah. traded Marty Reasoner for Sergei Samsonov, yeah. they brought uh, Rem Murray off of the scrap heap. So it's hard. It's hard to develop. Like they finally have Ryan McLeod in the system, who looks like he he could be a third line center, and uh, I think Gaetan Haas actually could be has the potential to be a third line center because he's got some speed. So we'll see if the Oilers can actually. Um, fill that. It is a fairly key hole on a, on on most teams. You know, the top six plus the third line center is a. <laughs> okay, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, just for the listeners, I think they might prefer yeah, not yeah, to have. No, a little... sorry about that. We just yeah. bell, we put a bell on her last few days. And she's, well, the uh... birds, the birds. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I I I just like Holland's general take on it like he's he seemed he seems like this is certainly seemed like this wasn't his first rodeo like it, it sounded like his 30th rodeo and but nonetheless i i think the orders can use that kind of steady hand experienced person uh running the show here and um count on him to make some some uh decent decisions uh out of this all right let's move on to the next thing he talked about bruce which is ryan nugent Hopkins. Mm. All right. I thought his stress was the right stress. His stress in the whole discussion was how important Nugent Hopkins was to the team. What a great player, versatile player he is, all the different things he can do. He just really focused on that. So he's he like you know, so he's negotiating a new contract with this guy, but there's no like uh cards close to your chest where you're you don't want to say he's a really good player a really valuable player no it's like he's making it clear they want to sign this player they want to sign him long term so you know so much for all the talk out there that they're going to move Nugent Hopkins and bring in Taylor Hall instead like which has been kind of a steady drum beat in the last five days but um I like that and um my own take Bruce on this contract is and I'm going to say this it might be not make a sense immediately, but I think it's in everybody's interest, all of their interests to wait for uh, about three weeks. See how this market plays out. See what the, see what the price is. Because you could say, well, if Nugent Hopkins signed now, he might get an overpay. Like he might be able to get ahead of the market and get a little bit more. Like if this is a really depressed market, and that's what I expect. But on the other hand, if a player gets too much in the NHL, especially a city like Edmonton, he just gets beat up over it. It gets pounded. Like, it's just, that doesn't work either. Like, is it worth getting another 500000 to a million dollars a year? Maybe it is. And get beat up over it for five years in a row. 
or to sign a, a deal that makes sense for everybody and everybody's satisfied with. And I think they'll, they'll all be able to determine that to some much better extent a month from now when they see what free agents like Hall and Peter Angelo get and Tyson Berry gets and all the other players, Tyler Toffoli, all the other players at the top of the list. What are these players in the UFA years getting in terms of term and contract? And I expect it might be a lot closer to Nugent Hopkins' current contract than the Matt Duchesne contract, which is often talked about. Like, I think that was, that's the old NHL with a rising cap. That's the old pre-COVID world where things, the economy was booming. This is a completely different world, and that's going to hit home in a big way in the next three weeks in the NHL. You see where there are after that, and that's when you want to sign Nugent Hopkins to a new contract. Yeah, you want to wonder what's going wrong in Nashville. You can look at their at their list of centers. I got four centers making twenty six million dollars, and not I don't know Matt Duchesne, Ryan Johansson, Kyle Turris, uh, you know Benino. I think is the fourth guy. I mean, man, that, that, I mean they're okay players, but. <laughs> Three years ago, if you know. said your centers were going to be those four players, everyone would have said, wow, you're going to win the Stanley Cup. Shows yeah. how things can ch- quickly things can change is what I would suggest. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they're all, they all represent every single one of them, except for maybe Benino. They're all overpays to serious overpays at this point, based on their season last year. They keep mm-hmm. trying to get that number one center and paying number one center money, and they can't get them. Not to mention trading Seth Jones for one. So anyway, uh, the case for Nugent Hopkins and, and uh, I wrote about this last night in the in the call to hockey. Uh, I'm sick and tired of seeing Oilers shipped out of town when they're 24, mm-hmm. 25, 26 years old, 27 years old as Nuge is now. Uh, last guy who sort of started with the organization and even made it to 28 was Alish Hemsky. Uh, he was the last guy who played for the Oilers who'd been with the team for 10 years. And he didn't, he, last time he played with the team was six seasons ago. He got traded at the deadline. And since then, the organization has just turned over, turned over, turned over, young, promising players, uh, you know, young players that didn't work out for sure. But one after another, after another, after another, they haven't um, they haven't found uh, uh, anybody to build around. And you know, you look around the National Hockey League, you look at <clears throat> any team. Like I just looked at Pacific Division, and other than Vegas Golden Knights, which only had a team for three years, so this kind of uh, it's kind of a relevant question for them. Every other team in the division has at least one player who's been on the team for at least 10 years. And the Oilers haven't had a decade-class player for six years. Finally, now they got Nuge. He's got, you know, nine years under his belt. He's under contract for, for that. But just let's get some continuity. Let's get some, you know, face of the team, guys. They don't all even have to be stars. I mean, Michael Backlund in Calgary, is, you know, he's just been part of the team for a long time. And it's part of the team identity. And the Oilers just keep going away from it, and this just in, it's not working. You know, the, in, in 2006, they had four players on the team who were, who were in the tracking for over 10 years in Edmonton and ultimately played that long here. And that group started to deplete when they traded away Ryan Smith over money the next year. And it's been downhill since then. And guess what? 14 years later, they made the playoffs one time. So it's never maybe, worked, has it? Maybe this idea of, of constantly uh, clearing out guys just, you know, just when they're sort of reaching their peak years. You know, I mentioned Taylor Hall, Jordan Eberle, Jeff Petrie, all guys that got cleared out five, six years into their career. All guys that are still uh, well, uh, good players, well-respected players that are helping other teams. And what is that? It's uh, at some point. I mean, the orders keep clearing out their managers too, so the new guys come in and they're they're changing things. I'm hoping Ken Holland is the guy that'll say, put the brakes on that and say, let's you know, let's 
keep and, and expand on our team identity. And obviously that's built around McDavid and, and Dreisaitl. But you also build that by having, you know, good players that just continue to contribute for your team for a long time. And, and Edmonton hasn't had that. And uh, I, for one, am sick and tired. You know, you, you want to have, as a fan, you want to have favorite players. Well, geez, they're always trading the guy. <laughs> It's frustrating. The closest as they've up. come to holding them is Horkoff and Hemsky recently, right? Like they mm-hmm. both kind of, they both yeah. were around to the kind of the end of their real usefulness. Like I'm glad, like they're like at near the end of Hemsky's career, yeah. there were some people saying they should give him a new five year contract at five or six million, and I thought, oh, geez, like that's that's crazy talk. It was like too banged up for that. Yeah, and you know the Horkoff stuck around until he was had bumped down to being a third line player essentially. So they have kept a couple of players kind of through their natural life cycle as a, as a player on a team. But I agree, they, they've got to do more of it. And Nuge is, Nuge is a good place to start. Bruce, it was only a few years ago that I was desperate, and I think other people were, to see Nuge on the wing. Um, I, I never thought he was a particularly strong NHL uh, center, at least in a first or second line capacity, if I'm completely honest. Like, I just didn't see the defensive strength in the defensive slot ever um, to really think Nuge uh, excelled. I think he was okay. Excelled in the capacity, especially defensively as a center. I really love him as a winger. He's a fantastic NHL winger. And he's a, he's, he's arguably a first line NHL winger. Oh, I mean, yeah. if you look after he joined with Dreisaitl, a player who he has a lot of chemistry with, he was in the top five NHL scoring or something like that. Top uh, in the last couple of months after Christmas, essentially. So they finally got him in the right role and he just thrived. He's just, he was spectacular in that role. And um, yeah, I'd love to see him on the wing with Dreisaitl or McDavid. I think he's a better fit with Dreisaitl um, for the next five, six, seven years. And um, hopefully they can do that. And again, I just, Hope they wait a little bit on that contract. I don't think they need to rush into it. And let's see what the market says and uh, go from there. Bruce, there was uh, news on Clefbaum. Not really that new because we talked about this last week. More of the same. Eh? It sounds like, you know, it's it was a real frank admission. This guy's been playing with a bad sh- bum shoulder for years now. And essentially... Um, he's he's in a lot of pain and it's limiting his play and you can you can see that eh? like we've talked about these defensive slumps with him. I wonder how much of it has to do with like oh god I can hardly get out of bed this morning my shoulder hurts so bad, you know and that coinciding with a defensive slump to when he's feeling good for a while there and and plays well. We heard rumors, um, you know that the Oilers were thinking of trading Clefbaum and part of it was his injury status right and I was thinking like so it was just really good to hear. Holland speak honestly, clearly about Clefbaum's injury status and, you know, cleared the air about where this player's at and uh, informed us a bit about his performance. It's not really that hopeful going forward. It didn't, like, there's no easy solution here. It sounded like even if there's surgery, there's pre- it sounds like there's pluses and minus to not having surgery, pluses and minus to surgery, just like there was with McDavid last year, what a complicated decision that was. Yep. So they're up in the air. And I guess I'd be more... Personally, I'd be more exercised about the whole thing, except I, I, again, I'm in this maybe camp of 10 people who think Caleb Jones is ready to be a top four D-man in the NHL. So I'm not as worried as many people are. I, I love the fact that Caleb Jones, it's like when I was waiting for Nugent Hopkins to get on the wing. He mm-hmm. finally got there. I'm, I want to see Caleb Jones now. I think he's completely ready and has paid his dues and has had two years on the bottom pairing and it, three years in Our club, yeah. pro hockey. And he's ready to go. And I think he's ready to step up into that role. So I'm, I'd am i be more exercised if that wasn't the case. Where are you at with Clef Baum? Well, I, I, yeah, well, Clef Baum, it sounds like the ball is pretty firmly in the player's court. And he's got some thinking to do and deciding decisions to make about his future. And I've heard some sort of shadowy talk that he sort of, reconsidering the whole thing and that he was uh, not thrilled about coming back to the bubble situation and in part because he was he was uh, playing with that injury and you know looking back on Clefbaum I'm I'm remembering how good he was in the 2016-17 season when he played all 82 games fantastic and 
And I remember him scoring the tying goal against San Jose in, in uh, game the critical game five when he blasted a 100-mile-an-hour slap shot off the post and in to send that game to overtime. And then you know what? It was that dastardly game five in Anaheim, the one where the Oilers had the 3 nothing lead in the late going, and Anaheim pulled their goalie and scored three times, and then Corey Perry scored in double overtime. And Kessler grabbed Talbot's pad and all that bad stuff. That was the game they lost. Andrew Sekera, basically they lost him. I, I, they never got that guy back. And Kleppbaum went out of that game. He missed game six. He tried to play game seven. And then the next year he had shoulder issues the whole year. And, and I'm not sure it didn't start in that one. Like if there's one date in the past that I'd like to ameliorate from the Oilers' history. It would be May 5th, 2017, Game 5 at Anaheim. Man, just a disaster, no matter how you look at it. Maybe in a, maybe they'll make a <laughs> sci-fi movie about that, Bruce. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a tough one. You know, the, the, the good news is the Oilers, the leftorium does exist uh-huh. on the Oilers. It still exists because they have Philip Broberg. I mean, listen, it's not crazy at this point to think when the NHL I don't know if Broberg has an out on his Swedish league contract this year or not it's not crazy to think Philip Broberg's third pairing defenseman on the Oilers this year like stranger things could happen if they ended up trading Russell now would you want to go into the season with Darnell Nurse top pairing Caleb Jones second and Philip Broberg third I mean I could think of worse things on earth at least all three of those players can really freaking skate and they can all really move the puck like this is the modern NHL like mm-hmm. if Broberg continues to have this kind of success um, that he's had early in his uh, Swedish league season, I mean he's flying out there, and uh, you got Jones and and Nurse, worse that you know, and Sam Rukovs looks like a player. William Logason, William Logason, how much difference really, honestly, is there between at this point William Logason and Chris Russell? I mean Chris Russell's thirty four, oh, I think three point two million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So I don't think the owners are that hard up on the left side. It's not obviously ideal to be losing Oscar Clefbaum, but this is the one position where they have outstanding depth and uh, or good depth. Outstanding. It's a little bit much for for anything on the owners except for the center position. Uh, so um, so I'm not I'm OK with how this is shaping up. I, I would still be OK if they move Russell to get some money for some other, to throw out some other positions, including maybe a winger for McDavid, so. If they move Russell, they'll be signing a, a veteran left D-man, I'm pretty sure, yeah. but not for a cap hit of four million, you know, they'll find somebody for for one million or 1.2. Maybe you know, uh, if they wait long enough, they can get Eric Gustafson, like for, yeah. on a ch- really cheap contract. Uh, well, just throwing be, that out. There's <clears throat> going to be players out there and, and, uh, uh, some of them are going to come cheap eventually, and it could well be that uh, you know they're, they're just due diligence to to add a left defenseman. Given you you have such uncertainty over the guy that played 25 plus minutes a game last year, so Holland kept saying 22, 23 minutes a game. I was a little surprised that he uh, wasn't a little more on top of clock bombs 25, 25 per game. Uh, last year in the top 10 in the NHL among among defensemen. But, uh... Oscar was a big part of the PK last year. Like, I think that, like, his work on the special teams was underrated. I I, I think his, his work at even strength wasn't great last year. It was okay. But his his work on the, on the both as a, um, on the PK and on the power play was outstanding. He was a crucial part of two units, which were close to league leading in one case and league leading in the other case, so. Um, there was he he Holland wouldn't tip his hand on Athanasiu and Benning um, too much, Bruce. What the sense I'm strong sense I'm getting from rumors and everything else, and he, his comment that Athanasiu didn't live up to expectations is they're not gonna they're not gonna match, they're not gonna qualify either of those players. They're probably maybe they hope to sign both of them at a lesser amount of money, and that makes really solid sense. Well, he said, I know what I'm going to do, but he didn't wouldn't go any further than that. And he also said, we have until Wednesday before it's final. So they may be in last-ditch negotiations to try and get these guys to, to agree to a lower figure. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm not sure uh, 
Like last year, I'm not sure how much confidence Dave Tippett had in Matt Benning, to be honest with you, in terms of the ice time he got. So that may be, they may just have decided to move on. I don't know. But in the case of Athanasiu, I think if they could get him for, you know, two million, they'd probably do it. But they don't want to pay three. And they certainly don't want to leave a qualifying offer out there that leaves options in the player's court, the arbitration thing that we've talked about before. So the only thing that could happen between now and Wednesday afternoon is you either hear the orders have come to terms with the player at some team-friendlier cap hit than $3 million, or he's hitting the market. And uh, if he does hit the market, it's still not impossible that he could go out, check other offers, go, holy crap, maybe I better take the offer that Edmonton gave me. It's not so bad. And see if it's still there. I mean, the, at a certain point, the managers can play a little hardball themselves, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, at this point, like if you're an RFA, you're not going to get qualified. You think, well, why not wait a few days and see what the market holds? Then, like maybe, maybe if I want more money, I'll I'll take that chance rather than taking this low, what I consider a low offer from the team. Mm-hmm. In terms of Matt Benning, I mean, the, the owners in the playoffs and otherwise, um, they need better puck moving defensemen. It's just as simple as that. And, and I was hoping that they would actually get rid of their bottom three worst puck moving defensemen maybe this year and bring in three guys who are as good at or better at puck moving than their top three guys. Like just have a complete transformation. And um, we'll see. I don't know if that's going to happen. I mean, Larson's going to be here. He's not, I think. He's not a great puck mover. But when he's healthy, he's a very, very good NHL and a very, very tough NHL defenseman. Um, but Bouchard, Evan Bouchard, come on, he had a, he had a really solid season in the HL. And I know some people who watch the HL down in Bakersfield, not everyone agrees with that. Um, but his stats, his, his point stats, and from what I saw, Bruce, he's ready to be a third pairing defenseman in the NHL, I think this year. And, um, it's, you know, if they're going to let go Benning with the idea of, of putting Bouchard in that role, I don't think that's crazy town. That's. Mm -hmm. That's probably sensible given the need for more puck moving on this team. And if Clef bombs out on the power play, yeah. Ethan Bear is a good power play player. Evan Bouchard can be an elite NHL power player. And I would like to see Bouchard. If you don't have Clef bomb, I think mm-hmm. you want Evan Bouchard on your team to, to, if Bear's struggling a little bit in that role, put Bouchard in there. Yeah, well, that's where I'm slotting them in. Is that you know th- three right defense? If you're trying to move them into the into the top four, you're begging for trouble. But if you put them at three RD, and there's a gaping hole on the power play, and I mean, I, Bear and and Bouchard would really be the the only two I think. I don't see Nurse as a long term solution on the power play. He got time the last couple of years because he's got some seniority there, but. Uh, um, Bear was very, very good in Seattle, and Bouchard just off the charts good on the on the power play in London, and and in uh, uh, Bakersfield last year. I mean, that's the strength of his game, is getting his shot through from the blue line, walking the line, seeing the pass. You know, just just his his offensive reads are tremendous, and and it's some exciting potential for that player working on this power play. Where you know you have a real sh- shooting threat and passing threat from the, from the blue line. Just like if you had a player on the blue line, it really made other teams nervous. Like sometimes there is that defenseman, yep. and it's all due respect to Oscar Kleffbaum, it's not him. So if you had that player, like who they're really nervous about getting the puck, that is Evan Bouchard. I think it, it can be as an NHLer. So we'll. We'll see. And, and, you know, there was a, the, his first highlight from the Swedish uh, second division was him scoring a goal. And it was a typical Bouchard goal, face-off draw. Puck goes back to him. He finds that seam and puts the puck in. And how many goals, Bruce, that we see from the point going in these NHL playoffs? Millions. It's just constant, Millions. constant goals. Yeah. Pucks directed at the net, you know, whether it deflected in, bounced in, rebounded in. Against the Oilers and by other nine, teams. Nine by Chicago. Yeah. Of the of 16 fifth, they got against yeah. Edmonton, nine of them started from the from the point shot or from a, from a defenseman firing away. And, and here's what I would say. Ethan Bear is okay. At, he's okay, like getting shots mm-hmm. through. Caleb Jones is actually really good because it, it, what you need is a bit of real um, skating ability. 
um, side to side lateral movement table to get that shot through. And Jones has it. And I, and it seems for whatever reason, Bouchard doesn't seem like he's particularly agile, but he gets that shot through consistently. And, and it's, he's got, he's big, big wins. He's like, a he's like, he's not as good as Brent, Brent Burns, obviously at this, but he's, he's that style of player right now. The big rangy guy with great hands who can get the puck through at net put it on net and cause trouble for the other team. Wouldn't that be great on the power play for the Oilers? Uh, and at even strength? Larry Murphy's my go-to comp for yeah. Evan Bouchard yeah. for, for playing style. But, uh, yeah, he's got the... Uh, he sees those shooting lanes and he's got an accurate shot that, you know, if there's a little lane to get the puck through, he gets it through it and uh, causes, as you say, lots of different ways to score off a point shot. One of them is for it to go straight in the net, but that's you know, one of several deflection, rebound, deflect in off the other team, hit some blocked in the slot, but bounces over to somebody else. You know, there's lots of, lots of ways chaos can come from an effective point shot. Um, the last thing we'll talk about, second last thing, is Pugliarvi. He talked about having some Zoom calls with Pugliarvi and his agent. They seem to be going well. It, it's, I really liked what Holland said in this regard. And again, his openness was, was he, he, the interview overall came across as kind of bland, but it was remarkably full of candor on a certain level. And he's just, he just essentially, it sounds like they're telling Jesse, you know, it's new manager, new coach, fantastic opportunity here, Jesse, but no guarantees. Like, no guarantees, my friend. Like whatever you had with Peter Shirelli or however that worked out or what you're thinking, right now for you coming back, there's no guarantees, but there's this great opportunity. And you know what? If Paul Yarvey doesn't want to bite on that, well, then you don't want him back, honestly. Like mm -hmm. that uh, is what I would say. What was your take on, on that? Yeah, no, nothing that surprised me there. I mean, other than that, it sounds like there's still relationship building, but I guess, I mean... By the time Holland came in here and Tippett, uh, yes, it was already gone. Yeah. So, I mean, it's all, all been done at long distance, but it seems like there's they had to climb a little bit of a hill. And, and we we don't know all the background, but uh, the uh, I think they're playing it right. I mean, opportunity, no, no guarantees. Last time they gave guarantees. And, you know, Shirelli guaranteed uh, Paul Yarby and Leto that in his 18-year-old season, he'd be on the roster at least 40 games. At least that's the only plausible interpretation for the way things went yeah, down. Yeah, that's clearly what And they pushed him ahead, and that set him, the team, everybody back, that they didn't have any options of ways to play it different. They couldn't do what Colorado did with Mikko Renton and give him nine games in his uh, in his first season and a full year down in the AHL and have him ready to go for, you know, for a second year. That didn't happen because promises were made and, and kept. But, you know, not that to anybody's advantage and really to, to the disadvantage of all. So, Bruce, overall, I think we can, we've had Holland here for a year now, more than a year. This is his second big summer coming up, I think. Overall, I, th I would give him a passing grade on last summer. I mean, the Broberg pick is certainly trending in the right direction. Um, I'd say most Oiler fans view that pick much more positively now, positively now than they oh, did yeah. when it was made. There's, just, there's a real excitement about the player now. And at the time, there was all kinds of people wishing they'd taken Cole Caulfield or Bondi or some of the other Z players. Zgrass. New Hook. There were some really good players, Zgrass. That's the main one that, that really came up at Christmas, right? During the World Junior Tournament, there was all of that unhappiness <laughs> came exploding out a volcano of, of um, upset. Um, there was the Lucic trade. There was, and then there was bringing in all these other players, right? Like Shane and Nygaard mm -hmm. and Haas and Archibald and, mm -hmm. and those all worked out. And then there was a, there was a little bit of a downer with the Athanasiu Mike Green trades where we, they gave up some really valuable picks for a fantasy you. And, and I think that, I think those, you know, obviously if he could have the, that trade back, he wouldn't make it today. But I think if we're completely fair to a fantasy you and to Holland, that was really affected by COVID. I mean, a fantasy you didn't get a chance to play 20 games at the end of the season with his team to find, maybe find a spot. 
Um, you know, we lost 10 games and then this whole salary cap situation has been changed where you can't, you don't want to qualify him at 3 million, which would have seemed like a no brainer. I think it, you, you wouldn't even thought of it too much at the time of the trade with the cap mm-hmm. going up. You think, yeah, we'll just qualify him and we'll get another year out of him. So this is, that's why you add in the second other second round pick for that next year. We're going to get out of this player. And that's, that's out the window. So I guess I'm going to cut him some slack there, but Bruce, I just really liked his demeanor and what he had to say. And what I would say overall, compared to other GMs, his experience is shining through. He seems very balanced. He seems not to make the, we need this with certainty, or we need to make a bold move with certainty, or we need to do, he's like, he's, he's always weighing things. He's just, and, and in, in, in the modern NHL, where that's what it's all about. Is not getting too excited necessarily about this or that, but you're always carefully, very carefully weighing all the options. And he seems to be someone who does that. Now, will he drive hard bargains? Is he is he good at doing that? Something that Shirelli was abysmal at. And something Holland was abysmal at in his final years in Detroit, who really made a lot of mistakes. So will he drive hard bargains? That's a question mark. Is he balanced though, and he, is he weighing things properly? Is he saying? Does he seem to be doing that? I would say, like he seems to be excelling in terms of the weighing things and measuring that kind of thing in terms of team building. What's your take? Yeah, I found his lack of specificity uh, uh, um, was slightly off-putting a time or two. Like, I mean, he mentioned that the Oilers have ten or fifteen players playing over in Europe. Well, it's fifteen. And he really should know that. And like, <laughs> the big difference between 10 and 15. And, uh, you know, it's just sort of a throwaway comment, probably. But uh, uh, I, I'd like, you know, a little more precision in, uh, in, those, uh, in those kind Didn't of things. Say, I mean, those are the kind of facts that the GM needs to be completely on top of. And Did he say uh, at one point the Oilers have the 12th pick? The 12th overall pick? Did I hear that? I thought I might have. I, maybe there I, some, maybe yeah, I, there was there was something about twelfth pick. I can't remember specifically. But. <laughs> yeah, I thought, there was, and I agree. There was a couple, couple times. I I'll agree with that. That's fine. Is that important? Uh, it, it's. I don't know if it's how important it is. It's to me. I mean, I'm a fact checker, right? So to me, it's important. But <laughs> yeah. it's. Uh, you know, you, you really want to have a guy who's on top of, I mean, you got a 50-man list and a 25-man reserve list or what. You, you you know, it's it's a lot of information, but it's a finite amount of information, and really you should be on top of it. And maybe it was yeah. just something where he just kind of threw a comment out there without putting enough thought into it. And there was, there was a, that happened a couple times. Like I mentioned, Clef Bomb's ice time. He mentioned several times, and every time he was light by by a couple of minutes. Um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, a small detail, but it's 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 factual detail. So uh, I'd be happier to hear those details be you know just spot on. But that's uh, possibly a minor criticism. You know, I like his overall attitude. I like it. I, I you know I think he's not going to. He's less likely to panic. I guess we can look at the trade deadline and say push the envelope. But as you say, what happens subsequent to the trade deadline changed everything so it's it would be probably unfair to judge him too harshly from that but it sure isn't unfair to look back and say holy moly orders gave up four draft choices for about 25 games of three players you know and they may wind up with none of those players after (laughs) after the dust settles here in the next week or so yeah even ennis they might not want back if they can get a better guy like you know he is coming Mm -hmm. off an injury he's injury riddled career to a certain extent so maybe well, they'll find someone else he was a rental and i mean for what they paid for him and what they got out of him you could say a fifth round pick for some good play down the stretch yeah. and in the play ins was worth it even if you got no more out of him but the the three picks going to uh going to detroit you know they're just at this moment in time not a hell of a lot to show for him and that that's uh um to say it's, it's harsh to be Overly critical, but it, I, I, it's not wrong to say, well, that sure in the hell didn't work out in Oilers' favor, and, and it's just part of the record. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, we we have the draft tomorrow. We do the uh, beginning of it. First round, and then we have mm-hmm. the. So we're going to be we have a couple busy days here, Bruce. We have the uh, 
So we'll probably do a, we'll, we'll see, we'll probably do some podcasts, at least one in the next, we'll do a draft podcast, maybe two. Mm -hmm. And then we got free agency on Friday. Yeah, well, we First have yeah, rounds, rounds two to seven are Wednesday morning. And then Wednesday afternoon is a, is a critical deadline for free agent qualifying or uh, uh, restricted free agent qualifying, which is Athens, CEO and Benning. But it's also a whole pile of other guys on other teams. That yeah. There's going to be guys that don't get qualified that are sort of newly sort of crystallized that they're actually going to enter the market that might be players of interest. So there's going to be lots of grist for the mill there. And unfortunately, only sort of a day or so to, to go through it all because on Friday, the free agent season just opens right away. So there's, everything's really compressed. I'm not quite sure why they had to crush everything down into sort of three yeah, why days. Didn't, yeah, why didn't they just delay the UFA period like another, like put that next week sometime, mm -hmm. next Wednesday? Like, I don't know why they had to telescope it like this. Like, and, and the only thing I would say about Holland, like I agree with you, I would prefer that he get all these little details right. And um, that said, there's probably, he's probably got a lot on his mind because it's like, I mean, there's oh, yeah. the draft, there's the RFAs, there's the UFAs, it's all happening all at once, so. Um, there's a lot going on. That said, they've had a long preparation period because they are already getting ready for the draft because it looked like it might have come in May. So, yeah. So. yeah, I mean, you want to you want to hear our thoughts on some of the draft prospects. There's a couple of podcasts we did back in, I think, May. Looking ahead at that time, they were talking about running the draft in the first week in June. And, of course, eventually that plan all changed. But at that time, we wrote a number of posts and... and uh, podcast specific to some of these uh, top uh, candidates that uh, we're finally going to find out here in the, tomorrow night which which one is going to come our way all right are you, are you secretly hoping for any of them bruce your secret pick is whom <laughs> your secret desire of your innermost oiler fan heart for the draft is oh i'm an old goalie i i have uh I have these wild dreams that they pick Askarov and he turns out to be the Vladislav Trecek of the 21st century. But I, I honestly, I don't think he's going to get down to 14. So it does not sound like it. Doesn't sound like it. So. My, my, I'm hoping for Seth Jarvis. He just, mm -hmm. he just, uh, he's a, they could use a winger. I mean, there's some really good centers though, too. And, you know, there's, and I, I don't, I, you know, but I, Jarvis's point scoring number from from junior just jumps off the page at me, so um, that's what I'm hoping for. All right, Bruce, thanks for talking. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>